Coming up on Chasing the Natty, systems are key in CFB, and we got Nate Marquise on in order to talk about the biggest and most impactful coaching changes from around this college football world. In addition, we got a whole new batch of Transfer Portal players to talk about all that and more coming right after this. Zappi looking to Jarrett Stearns who makes the catch and scores. What a burst! Trey Vaughn Anderson! As advertised, touchdown Buckeyes! This is Chasing the Natty, a college fantasy football podcast. All right, welcome in everybody. This is Jared Palmgren, host of the Chasing the Natty podcast. And y'all, I am so excited for today because we got a lot of stuff to talk about for you guys today. But before we even get started, please make sure if you are listening, make sure that you're subscribed on YouTube. Make sure you're following us on all of our pod- podcast platforms, whether that be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all those great stuff. If you leave a five-star review, those are going to be always very helpful. I'm just getting that stuff out of the way, y'all, because we, again, we got so much to talk about and so little time to do it. But I want to thank all of you guys for listening, coming on today, and I want to reintroduce a guest that we've had on in the past, and really, there's no other way to say it, but Mr. Nate Marquise is on again. So, Nate, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great tonight, Jared. Thanks for having me on again, man. I'm excited to uh, uh, to discuss some of the the coaching changes, some of the systems that are uh, that are going to be on the move, and how it relates and how it's going to impact a lot of the uh, the college fantasy football for this year, man. I'm, I'm pumped. I am as well. And before we even get to that, we got two or we got one announcement, one big piece of news that I think is going to be worth us talking about today. And then after we talk about those coaching changes, we'll be giving you guys a whole nother batch of uh, transfer portal players for you guys to discuss and figure out how they will impact this up coming season so with that being said we'll just go ahead and get started with the first announcement and this is y'all i'm so excited about this if you haven't seen this on twitter already first of all you're probably living under a rock but even so i am very very excited to announce that chasen natty is moving over to (coughs) campus to canton as the official cff podcast of campus to canton and in addition to that I will be leading the CFF content creation over there, and I have put together a wonderful, wonderful team of guys, including the guy right above me as we are talking, uh, Mr. Nate Marquise. In addition, I will also be bringing on, or also bringing on Brandon Sanders from the CFFU podcast, and then Mr. Chris Moxley, who is already a part of Campus Canton, will be moving over to us with the CFF team and will be heavily involved in CFF content moving forward. And y'all, I'm very excited about this. Nate, what are your thoughts on this? Oh, I'm I'm stoked, man. I, I've you know I'm somebody that's been involved in the fantasy college fantasy community for quite a while on Twitter, just trying to do what I can to um, you know bring more people into into that arena, uh, trying to promote it as much as I can, trying to get uh, as much um, discussion and dialogue going on. So um, I really uh, you know I'm really thankful to to hop on with Campus of Canton and 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 you and. And man, Chris has been putting out uh, just a ton of great content lately. So, uh, and, and I've, I've enjoyed working uh, with Brandon's, Brandon Sanders on some other things in the past. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, I think this is a really, really uh, big deal. And I think that it's, um, you know, just going to create even even more eyes to the college fantasy football world. And that's that's really all I've, all I've really wanted over this time that I've been doing this. I really couldn't agree more. And like part of the reason why I really want to join these guys, because again, they've created a format that is basically providing a bridge for people who normally play NFL to start looking at the college side of things a little bit more and have fun doing it. Like I love the Devi community and I love the people I, I talk with those guys all the time, because again, we all love the same players with the college football, college players, but with campus of Canton, your college players now actually mean something during the season before they actually get to the NFL. There's a whole side of your league that is dedicated to earning points on the college side. And so with that, they are hoping to bring guys like us on in order to make sure that people are as knowledgeable as they can be 
on the college side of those leagues and also in the process the bigger that we grow the bigger that they grow it's just a great mutual relationship that we got going on here and again i'm very excited we got podcasts including chase and natty will be the official cff podcast of campus again moving forward i think i've said that already but in addition guys we got ideas for more podcasts moving forward and once we get those things finalized I am very excited to bring that all to you. And also, we will have our own segment of the Campus Canton website where we will be uploading written content for you guys moving forward. Again, this is the first time I've really had a platform like this and bringing on guys in order to work together as a team. I'm very, very excited for what the future has for us. And yeah, there's nothing more I really have to say uh, on this. So we'll go ahead and hit up the... Really, I, again, I kind of threw this in here because to me it didn't warrant its entire own segment, but I think it's worth discussing here. And it's not every day that in college football you get a whole new team to start researching over the summer. And But that's what we got this year. Uh, in the crazy year that was 2021 in college football, why not just add another team in here? And that's James Madison is officially moving up to the FBS along with several other FCS schools in the future, but they're going to go ahead and move up this year, I believe the official announcement has been made, to the Sun Belt Conference. So we're just going to kind of briefly go through like what me and Nate have found on this team so far, because again, this is a whole new team. Like as much, of, as much as I'm a big college football fan, I'm not a huge uh, expert when it comes to all the FCS teams, because that's a whole another hundred some odd teams to learn, and I don't have, enough, I don't have a big enough brain for that. Um, so we'll go through some of the things here that uh, I think are kind of important or Nate thinks are important as well. So Nate, we'll go ahead and start with you. What What's some of the things you think are important when it comes to James Madison? Well, I mean, number one, this is, even though they are FCS program or they, or they were, they've been extremely successful. Um, you mm-hmm. know, their former coach, uh, Mike, Mike Houston is now at ECU and he's been there for a few years. He's done a decent job. So um, it's a program that that is not new to being successful uh, on their level. So jumping up, I'm, I think more than anything, I'm curious to see when the schedule comes out, what exactly that looks like, because I think that's going to play a role as far as, um, you know, with their non-conference, um, you know, are they, you know, are they going to have a soft schedule that we can make some of their uh, some roster moves with them and, and feel comfortable being able to play them, but it's going to be a total crap shoot for those first couple of weeks anyways, just until we get a feel for, uh, how well they can translate to the next level. So, um, I mean, they had some really nice passing numbers last year. I'm sure you'll kind of go into it, but probably the, the player that sticks out the most to me is, is Chris Thornton. Um, he's returning at wide receiver. He was their second leading wide receiver last year, uh, 83 catches over a thousand yards, 13 TDs, uh, their leading wide receiver, uh, Wells, moves on to South Carolina. So um, he's somebody that um, that I would probably be taking a look at and seeing, okay, um, you know, maybe we pull the trigger on him as a wide receiver late in drafts, just kind of take a flyer on somebody. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more on Chris Thornton, and I'll I'll kind of use that to transition over to the quarterback position. So the past last year, uh, Cole Johnson was their quarterback, and I believe he was a six year. He's out of eligibility. Uh, wish he would have been able to come back this year because I definitely would have been considering him uh, very late in drafts as well. Heck, I probably would have considered him like in the mid rounds, maybe if that's where I was looking at. Because again, last year he had 422 passing attempts, uh, 3,779 yards, 41 touchdowns to four interceptions. In addition, he's also has a little. He had a little bit of dual threat ability, 86 carries for 236 yards and six touchdowns. But he, again, he's gone. He is, I believe, off to the NFL. I think they're, I think he's draft. I believe he's entered the draft because uh, again, he's out of eligibility. So where else does he have to go? So who does that bring to us now? Well, I'll admit it's not the most inspiring option in the world, but former starting quarterback for Colorado State, Todd Santeo, has transferred from Colorado State over to James Madison. Now, James Madison if this is the kind of system that I believe it is, it's just if they're going to give him 422 passing attempts throughout the year, I think he can very much be successful with that, especially if Chris Thornton can translate up to that FBS level. And again, I already kind of highlighted a little bit that the system is already willing to use a dual threat nature in their quarterbacks because again, last year you saw 
236 yards and six touchdowns out of Cole Johnson. I think that Todd Santeo, who has shown a dual threat ability at Colorado State, could definitely improve on those numbers here. Um, again, Nate, you already uh, touched on Chris Thornton. I do want to throw out Latrell Palmer, uh, their running back. He had 187 carries and 941 yards and three touchdowns last year. Obviously, you're going to want those touchdowns to go up a little bit, maybe him get a bit more opportunities around the goal line. Uh, but even still, 187 carries, nothing really to sneeze at. Um, I definitely would love to see that get up to 200. But, you know, if you're kind of in a much deeper league and you're looking for somebody that maybe nobody else is considering, I guarantee you some of these James Madison or uh, people aren't really thinking about James Madison because, again, they're new this year. Nobody's really had a feel for them yet. Um, the only other point that I really kind of want to point out here is, again, Nate, you already touched on it, is the fact that we're not entirely sure how this offensive system is going to translate moving up a level. Now, granted, it's a Sun Belt. Sun Belt isn't exactly known for like super stout defenses against um, even the top of the FBS. But even still, we don't have any data points to really give us an idea due to the fact that uh, James Madison over the last two years has not played a FBS school. So they do have a very weak out-of-conference schedule next year um, in Middle Tennessee State, Norfolk State and Louisville. Louisville, obviously a Power 5 school, but their defense has never been something that people exactly fear. So I could see James Madison maybe still being able to put up some points in that game. Those are That's kind of my spiel on it. I've been talking for a while. Nate, anything else you want to respond to on that? No, I just, uh, I'll just add, like, like you said, it's, it's definitely a wait and see scenario. Um, but like you mentioned with Centeo, he, he does – it does appear that if they're going to, for instance, they, they ran Cole Johnson uh, 86 times last year. So mm-hmm. it at least is a staff um, that has a system in place where they're, they, they've shown a willingness to run the quarterback, uh, which is exactly what Centeo would need in order to be successful. So, um, and, and the quarterback had six rushing touchdowns. So clearly he's getting some of that uh, goal line vulture uh, action from the, uh, from the running back there. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just something to keep an eye on, but it, it looks like it, at this point, um, a fit for Santeo should he uh, win the job and and uh, and be the guy next year. Yeah, I definitely he'll definitely be somebody like when I get into a best ball league or like if I get into a really deep dynasty league, I'll take a shot at Santeo. Yeah. All righty. So with that news out, with the announcement out of the way, with that little bit of news out of the way, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this week's podcast. We're going to go ahead and talk about the biggest and most impactful coaching changes of the offseason. And we are going to start. We actually, the way we have this um, segment set up is that we have three positive um, coaching changes and three negative coaching changes. And that's from the perspective of the school that is hiring them. So like positive being like, this is going to be good for the CFF players there. Negative being like, this is going to be bad for the CFF players. But I felt like more than anything, We should start with the biggest coaching change overall. And in my opinion, not entirely sure how I feel if it's a good or a bad thing moving forward for this program, at least from a CFF perspective. And that's Lincoln Riley from Oklahoma to USC. Now, Nate, you are a Oklahoma guru. And so you probably are closer to this situation than I have, or I personally know anybody else. So I'm going to let you start off with this. What do you think about Riley going to USC? What kind of impact do you see this having on the players on that roster, as well as the players who are probably transferring in to that roster? What do you think? Well, what a uh, what a difference a month makes. Uh, I think it was about a month ago, whenever you had me on, um, and uh, Caleb Williams wasn't even in the portal uh, at that mm-hmm. time. He, he hadn't even really announced. Uh, he did, uh, I think, a couple of days after our pod. But um, as, as far as the fit of Lincoln at USC, I mean, I do think he's going to be successful really anywhere that he goes. I was just thinking about it earlier with Caleb Williams following him and obviously Mario Williams and, and a handful of other players, uh, Travis Dye, along, along the West Coast that uh, have, have also come there. One thing we know is that he is going to produce outstanding quarterback fantasy production. Um, Mm -hmm. They're literally, I I don't know, as far as somebody that has, you know, more than just a few years of experience calling plays, I don't know that there's any other, um, any other 
offensive coach that is as productive with quarterbacks as him from Baker Mayfield, Tyler Murray, Mm -hmm. Jalen Hurts, even, even Spencer Rattler's 2020 season was actually really nice. And, um, and up until the point last year where, where Riley had kind of checked out, um, Caleb Williams was putting up fantastic numbers. I mean, historically only, only coaches like Cliff Kingsbury and Dan Mullen and Tom Herman have, had quarterbacks be as consistent in college fantasy as Lincoln. And those guys aren't even in college football anymore. So he's the best. Um, I do fully expect Caleb Williams um, to shine there. Um, I I think he should be considered uh, a top five college fantasy football quarterback. I think he's number four, three or four in my initial rankings right now. Um, Obviously it's really early on. Um, They're, they're the, that defense is horrendous. They're going, they're, they're going to be playing so much more catch up this year um, and, and chasing points than they did at Oklahoma uh, under Riley. And yeah, the line's pretty atrocious um, for sure. And Caleb's going to be on the run more, but like I said, if you're chasing points, uh, that's what you want for college fantasy. You don't, you don't want quarterbacks that are constantly playing from the lead. You want, those guys like Sam Hartman and Brennan Armstrong last year, guys like that, that their defense is terrible and they're constantly in shootouts. Uh, So there's a lot of that potential with, uh, with Riley moving out to the West coast. Uh, Yep. I don't think I could have put it any better myself. Um, The the position I'm a little concerned about is the running back position, because it seems like they got a lot of guys there. Cause I think Keontae Ingram's still there. He hasn't transferred out. They just brought Ingram. Ingram's Ingram's gone pro. Oh, he's going pro. I completely missed that. Um, but even so, they're bringing in some of these guys. And I guess I'm a little concerned, especially after what I saw last year with like Eric Gray and Kennedy Brooks, where like what who looked like the person that we were all going to um, expect to do great things just disappeared and it would turn out to be somebody else. Um, and Riley is no stranger to um, splitting the running back or splitting the running the. Oh my goodness, sure. Try again. <laughs> he is no stranger to splitting the load between his running backs. So I guess I'm a little concerned there, especially with some of the talented backs that he is bringing in. It feels like maybe that's killing off some of their uh, CFF upside compared to where they were. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit more once we get to the transfer portal guys. Um, but yeah, I agree with you 100% on the quarterback. Like Caleb Williams is going to be a monster this upcoming year. He's got the weapons. Mario Williams and uh, Gary, Gary Bryant Jr., uh, Taj Washington, all three of those guys, I think, are going to be um, on the field and perfect for him to play around with. So, yeah, I got really not much else to say on this that you hadn't already covered. Yep. So, let's go ahead and talk about somebody that I think we can universally agree is good for his new program, and that is Zach Kitley, former offensive coordinator at Western Kentucky, moving on to be the offensive coordinator now at Texas Tech. If you haven't heard of what Kitley did for Western Kentucky last year, uh, you flat out were not paying attention to uh, college fantasy at all because, as Nate, you said in your articles, which, by the way, I totally forgot to plug that, a lot of the background for what we're discussing here today, y'all, is going to be for Nate's uh, first set of articles that will be coming out for the Campus to Canton CFF articles. And there he will be discussing some of the stock up and stock down uh, players going forward, especially here in the kind of spring practice portion of the off season. So Nate, is there anything else you want to say about that real quick before we continue? I, I'm so sorry. I completely forgot about that. No, it's all good, man. Um... Yeah, as far as the article, it should be coming out here uh, very shortly on the Campus Ken website uh, website there. But uh, yeah, I really just wanted to take a little bit of a dive, highlight a handful of players at each position um, that have been stock up from the end of the regular season. So taking into account kind of what transpired during the bowl season um, up until this point now, before we head into spring practices. And then, you know, after spring practices take place, maybe we uh, reassess and say, okay, now here's the new guys that we're looking at that could be stock up or stock down. But yeah, just factoring in, okay, um, how how is this player impacted by the transfer portal or the coaching changes or injuries or unexpected uh, NFL player, uh, NFL guys declaring for the NFL? So yeah, I just kind of wanted to take a look at that. And, um, and, and obviously that does tie in really well with 
what we're talking about here tonight and, and all the, um, you know, how, how impactful a offensive coaching system can be when it comes to college fantasy. Cause in, and that's really one of the bigger differences between college and NFL is that um, systems rule. Um, mm-hmm. It's sometimes it isn't the talent. Sometimes it, it literally is the system that makes the biggest difference. And again, Y'all, please go check out that article. Nate has been working very, very hard on that. I have seen many, many different iterations of that article. And again, he's put a ton of time and effort into it. So make sure you go read that and read it to its fullest. Let's get back on topic here. Let's go ahead and keep talking about Mr. Zach Kitley, offensive coordinator now at Texas Tech. And Nate, I know for a fact several you have several players in that article that are stock up simply because of this move right here and why else because last year for west kentucky bailey zappi their quarterback or in the entire team really uh had 677 passing attempts which were good for 6072 yards 63 passing touchdowns and 12 interceptions that is an insane workload i have never seen a college offense passed that almost 700 times in a season in a, in a 12 game season that is just absolutely nuts to me and it really just not only does it affect the quarterback but just look at the top receivers here Jarrett Stearns the number one wide receiver 150 receptions for 1,902 yards and 17 touchdowns Mitchell Tinsley had 87 receptions for 1,402 yards and 14 touchdowns Daywood Davis had 43 receptions for 763 yards and eight touchdowns, and Malachi Corley had 700, or excuse me, 73 receptions for 691 yards and seven touchdowns. That's the top four receivers, and those are basically almost all fantasy relevant right there. That's four receivers on one team that, in, in, in at least in a deeper league, that is good enough for all of those players to at least be rostered. That is absolutely insane to me. And so, Nate, can we expect the same thing here at Texas Tech? I don't know if we're if we can expect the so one of the one of the things that made that transition from Houston Baptist, which was the FBS program where Kitley was at as the offensive coordinator uh, before he went to Western Carolina. One of one of the things that made it so successful with that transition was that. Bailey Zappi is quarterback, Jareth Stearns, uh, the wide receiver, and uh, Stearns' younger brother, uh, and I think even one other wide receiver, I can't remember his name, but he had four players come with him from that Houston Baptist offense to to Western Kentucky. So, uh, and obviously the biggest one being Zappi and and having the quarterback that just knows that system and has been in it for the last couple of years. That's not going to be the case here. Um, In fact, there's... And I mentioned it in my article. There's, they're really. I mean, this is going to be the probably from a fantasy perspective, the the spring competition that we're going to pay attention more than any other, and that's the quarterback competition at Texas Tech because you just mentioned it. I mean, when you're when you're talking 650 plus passes, um, there's the the ceiling for whoever wins between Donovan Smith. Tyler Shook or Baron Morton is going to be enormous. Um, and I, and I mentioned in my article that I'm, I'm planting a tiny little flag on, on Tyler Shook right now. Um, I know a lot of people like, I like Donovan Smith. I, I, I like his game quite a bit. He, but if we're going, if we're saying, okay, Bailey Zappi is the prototype that we have to go by that. That's what Kitley looks for in a quarterback. That's not Donovan Smith. That is more Tyler Shook. Um, I do think it's, I mean, Tyler Shook was somebody he, he's he's graduated. He could have transferred um, again. He came from Morgan initially. He could have transferred again. He chose not to. I think that's that's important. He realizes that there's some upside for him being in this offense, um, and he just kind of fits a little bit better. Um, Baron Morton is really uber talented as well, but he's he's raw. He's still got a ways to go. So right now, I would I would actually give a slight edge to Tyler Shook. Um, and, and just kind of see how that plays out. But, but obviously, um, I don't know, what are your thoughts on, on the running back room? I mean, obviously, it's a talented room. Sir Roderick Thompson supposedly mm-hmm. is back. Um, Taj Brooks is going to be there. Even White has shown at times he can play a little bit. But Kitley hasn't used running backs all that much. At least he did in Western Kentucky. He used them a little bit at Houston Baptist. Either way, it's kind of a crowded room. What are, what are kind of your thoughts on, on if, is there, I mean, should we devalue these running backs quite a bit? 
So if they both stay, yes. Um, I do have Noah Whittington as one of my sleepers for this year. He was the running back of Western Kentucky last year. Uh, I do think he's now going to get a, bit, a little bit bigger portion because I think Kid, Kidley's smart enough to know when he has a talented guy. And I think Whittington was talented enough for him to still use him last year. Because again, like I said, in terms of rushing, they still rush for over a thousand yards as a team last year. Now, again, obviously you would want one guy to have over a thousand yards, but even still, like they, they, there's still rushing going on in this team. So if we get through the spring and one one of the guys between Sir Roderick Thompson or Taj Brooks transfers out, and then maybe it solidifies that running back room back down to one guy, I think it might be worth taking them. But if they're both still there by the time the fall comes, I would personally be off of those guys. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head because, again, 130 teams. But neither Sir Roderick nor Taj Brooks really have a tonning receiving prowess, do they? Um, Thompson has showed, I mean, they, so white actually used to be a wide receiver. He he's mm-hmm. transitioned from wide receiver to running back. So clearly you'd think he could catch a little bit. Thompson's been decent. Um, he's been decent in the passing game. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're, you know, they, they, they don't have a ton of, um, a ton of receiving production. I would say if, if one of them could really like, again, we're all obviously going to be like, knee deep in whatever practice reports come out of texas tech uh once spring practices starts but if one of them to me even if they're both still there if just one of them starts showing that they will be the receiving back for this team i think that immediately puts their stock up going forward even if they don't run the ball a ton because that's just another weapon for them to use in the passing game yeah um one thing i did want to mention before we moved on from kitley is should talk about Western Kentucky because a lot of people are not going to be off Western Kentucky. It's like, oh, the architect of that offense is gone. Like, they're going to move on from that. I heavily disagree. And I, I think I may have mentioned this on the pod before and everything, but Ben Arbuckle is now the offensive coordinator at Western Kentucky. And he was the offensive quality control analyst for Zach Kitley's offense at both Houston Baptist and Western Kentucky. Western Kentucky, people's jobs there right now are entirely dependent on them replicating the the success that they saw on the offense last year. I highly doubt they're going to be fully moving away from that system. So I'm telling everybody out there, do not move off of Western Kentucky players just yet. Keep an eye out on Western Kentucky during the spring and the fall. Find out who those top guys are going to be because you're going to get a massive, massive discount on them if people are still going to be moving off of them. What do you think, Nate? Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see what their value ends up being once we get some of these drafts uh, going, because you'll have, I, I think, two different um, two different types of people drafting, and that's those that have seen the mass exodus and and know that Kelly's gone and think, okay, Western Kentucky's no longer relevant, and then there's going to be those that maybe don't realize just how impactful Kelly is and see what Western Kentucky did last year and think that it's highly likely that they could replicate that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I still think there's some value there at Western. I mean, like, like you mentioned, um, they're uh, yeah, Tyson Helton. I mean, his job depends on them mm-hmm. being say like Kitley saved his job is what he did. Yeah. Um, so he, he depends on them keeping it up. They got Jalen Hall in from Western, uh, Michigan, as well as uh, Michael Matheson from from Akron, so they've got some some parts that are replacing Mitchell Tinsley, Jarrett Stern, some of the wide receivers that they lost. So I do think that um, that it, for the right price, they there could still be some value with Western Kentucky. Absolutely, and again, like you mentioned, those two guys, and I imagine those those two wide receivers are going to be the names that people put out there. I'm going to throw out Malachi Corley because he's the guy that he's pretty much their top receiver coming back from last year. Yeah, uh, David Davis had more receiving yards, but Malachi Corley had 30 more receptions than him. So I have a feeling that he's really their true number one wide receiver there, um, at least coming back from the people that they have. So I'm going to throw him out there as a very, very late round sleeper for you guys moving forward. All right. Let's go ahead and talk about one of these coaching changes that we think is a bit more on the negative side. And Nate, I'm going to let you start off on this one. Uh, We're going to go Mario Cristobal, head coach, formerly at Oregon, now at the U, Miami. We're also going to throw in the news that we got here today of Josh Gaddis, former offensive coordinator at Michigan, now going to be the offensive coordinator at 
Miami. What are your overall thoughts on this, Nate? Is it like, again, I have the negative sign here, but do you agree with that? Do you think this is like an overall negative, uh, negative change for the players at Miami going forward? Well, I think this is a perfect example of where you have to differentiate between um, college football and college fantasy football. I think, I think both crystal ball and uh, Josh Gaddis being hired are, I think, I think those are really good fits from a coaching standpoint. I think that that's going to get the Miami hurricane program going in the right direction. Again, from a fantasy football standpoint, I, I would agree that this is um, you know, that this will have a negative impact. We're going from Rhett Lashley um, who is, you know, we're, we're talking about big time offensive coordinators and systems that have, that have proven successful. Rhett Lashley mm-hmm. is one of those. He is one of those guys for sure. Um, he's done it for a few years. So, um, crystal Ball's known for, I mean, he's notorious for being a little too hands-on, uh, with his OC and, you know, they get kind of tired and, and move on. He's had his last two OCs have moved on one move to, to really low G five programs. Um, uh, Joe Moorhead moved on to Akron. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the guy before him, uh, Arroyo moved on to UNLV. So, I mean, I think, I think his OCs, get tired of not being able to run their system to, um, to its max potential. He kind of limits that. Keep in mind, no, no fantasy football quarterback um, has scored. No, no quarterback under, under Mario Cristobal has averaged more than 21 points per game. Uh, and, and, and that's at Oregon. I mean, that's at Oregon where they're known for high flying offenses. That's, that's with Joe Moorhead as your, as your OC who was, uh, incredible as an OC at Penn State and um, Colin plays at uh, Mississippi State. Uh, and that also includes Justin Herbert. So, uh, you know, I mean, he couldn't make Justin Herbert all that fantasy relevant. Um, Gaddis is good, but, and, and Michigan obviously was really fantasy relevant this year, uh, mm-hmm. but he spent, he spent three years there in Michigan and he didn't have a fantasy relevant player for the first two years that he was there. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's impactful. His his motto is uh, is speed and space, and um, which but I think is kind of funny because Michigan more reminds me of kind of more physical in a phone booth than speed and space. But um, but it, I do think that those guys will get the offensive line going, and that we could see um, we could see some strong running back play on down the road. Uh, we'll see if it happens in year one. In year one, I think. We're potentially looking at maybe a running back by committee there uh, early on, though. That would be very that, that sucks. That, that sucks for for those Jalen Knighton shares. I know. That's what I have to say. That's going to very be very unfortunate for those Jalen Knighton shares. And, and this is also breaking my heart because again, I really like Tyler Van Dyke coming out of last year. Dude was absolutely on fire down the road for Miami last year. Looked like a totally different team than what they had to start the year. Again, love Derek King, but. It was very clear he was holding back that offense by the end of it, and Tyler Van Dyke really came in and just gave that offense some new juice. Charleston Rambo finally became the alpha wide receiver that I was hyping him up to be in the preseason. And now it feels like it's like, all right, we got something going here, and then we got the change at head coach, we got a change at offensive coordinator. Completely different shift in the offensive identity because we could be looking at a run heavy team here going forward, which again, very unfortunate after what we saw Van Dyke do last year. So overall, again, you're right. I think for the U in terms of CFB, in terms of their chances of winning more games, I think this is a good move, but in terms of the players you can get out of Miami going forward, it definitely feels like that is limited at least for the time being. Yeah, it's, and it's one of those things too. Sorry, I was just going to hit okay. on one, one last thing that just came to mind. It's, you know, Miami, they waited forever to make this uh, offensive coordinator hire and, and names had been floated out there like Kendall Bryles or uh, Jason Campbell from Toledo, uh, even Joe Brady, Ken Dorsey up at the Bills, you know, all these, you know, just offensive gurus and, and for everybody holding those, uh, Tyler Van Dyke shares just like yeah yeah Joe Brady are you serious absolutely I want that you know? oh yeah oh my god and then and then you see Gaddis and you're like ah well ah, I don't know I mean that's it's just it's it's a very lukewarm college fantasy football hire yeah I, w- I would definitely agree 
Uh, one higher, again, we're going to go back to a positive side of things that I don't think a lot of people are going to be very lukewarm about is Jay Norvell, head coach at Nevada, staying within the Mountain West, but now moving over to Colorado State. Uh, why should we be excited about this? Well, Carson Strong last year, 524 passing attempts for 4,000 yards, or 4,186 yards, 36 touchdowns, 8 interceptions. Not only that, so Carson Strong, obviously off to the NFL. If you're listening to this, you've been watching the Senior Bowl, you've been watching NFL draft coverage. So, but who does Norvell bring with him? Because this is another one of these cases, kind of like Lincoln Riley, where they're basically picking up the players that they used to have at their old school, and they're just like, hey, come along with me. We'll, we'll do the exact same thing. We're just in a different zip code. Um, but he's bringing with him Clay Millen, his heir apparent after Carson Strong. It looks like he will be the starting quarterback for them next year. Torrey Horton, a very talented wide receiver that they had going last year. As well as Melkin Stovall, uh, also bringing with him over to Colorado State. This doesn't even mention the players that were already at Colorado State. I mean, Steve Adazio, God bless Colorado State. I don't know what they were thinking with that hire. Um, Awful. Awful hire, but even still, already there, Dante Wright, who is a CFF darling the past couple of years. People have been hyping him up for years. Imagine him in a Jay Norvell offense where they do almost nothing but pass the ball like that. Ah, he would be absolutely incredible. They can come up with creative ways to use him. I'm excited. David Bailey definitely is kind of an interesting one because he is that kind of just run between the tackles kind of running back but he did show some receiving prowess down the line for colorado state last year and then i'm also going to throw out the backup tight end from last year obviously people know about trey mcbride he's off to the nfl but the backup tight end there gary williams was getting plenty of work last year it's just he was being overshadowed by trey mcbride but now he is the guy front and center to be at the tight end position. And we've seen Norvell and his offense utilize that tight end in Cole Turner last year. So I'm excited to see what Gary Williams can do for them this year. So yeah, I'm excited about this. I am excited about a lot of the players here. And I think you can get a lot of these players at a pretty decent discount right now. What do you think, Nate? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you from, uh, from a personal standpoint, I'm, I'm rooting for Colorado state to, uh, uh, to get good again. It's Fort Collins is one of my favorite uh, cities in, in the country. I, I love, uh, I go uh, once a year, I'll go rock climbing out in that area. So uh, I'm rooting for them to do well. First thing I did whenever they made that hire was Google to make sure that Matt Mummy uh, was coming with uh, Jay Norvell. Matt Mummy is the offensive coordinator uh, that works under Jay Norvell. Uh, for those of you that don't know, his dad is Hal Mummy, uh, who is the architect of the air raid, so to speak. He's, he's the first, he's the one that Mike Leach actually learned it from. So, um, and, and Matt mummy is coming with him. So that offense, um, you know, it's just gonna, it's just gonna move on over from Nevada to, to Fort Collins, which should be really fun to watch. Um, Millen is the quarterback that comes with him. Who's already got one year in the system with Mummy and Norvell, so you would think that that'd be a fairly smooth transition there with him taking over. Um, Horton, also a wide receiver, I think could be an impact player. You mentioned Dante Wright. I, you know, it just kind of dawned on me as we were talking about it here. He's somebody I definitely could have put on my um, my stock up mm -hmm. uh, report. I, he, I, as funny as it, as it, as it may be, they I, I spent all this time last year. Whenever they, whenever they made the coaching hire, they did. I was pounding the table, say, avoid Dante Wright, avoid mm -hmm. this guy. There's, a, there's just, there's no evidence um, in wide receivers being successful in that system. They didn't have it in Boston College. They're not going to have it in Colorado State. I think the opposite can be said now. I think that um, there is now some really, really nice opportunity. I hope that um, he, uh, he, he gets that system down during the spring and can kind of um, take off like a rocket ship this fall. Again, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm extremely excited about pretty much every player involved in that offense. And again, Gary Williams is probably not a guy that's on anybody's radar. Torrey Horton, getting even as a wide receiver two in this offense, I think you get him at a great discount. I do know Dante Wright is going off pretty early, I'd say, in CFF drafts already. People kind of keyed in on that pretty quickly. Um, but again, this is an offense that can support more than one wide receiver. So whoever the number two guy is, go ahead and stick your flag. You'll probably get him at a great, great discount. Discount. Discount going forward. All right. 
going from positive to negative. Let's hit up another negative coaching hire for CFF. And I promise y'all, I'm not looking at this through uh, red and black tinted glasses, uh, <laughs> but we will be talking about Billy Napier, formerly the head coach of Louisiana, now going to be the head coach of Florida. Nate, I'll let you get started on this one. Why is Why are we considering this a negative hire for CFF? Well, like I mentioned earlier, um, we're, we're going from Dan Mullen's system. And um, Dan Mullen was right up there with Lincoln Riley as, as it pertains to quarterback um, fantasy football success. Clearly, he screwed up a, uh, you know, a, a situation last year between Emory Jones and Anthony Richardson. And it probably, I don't know, it may have cost him his job. Uh, Richardson's just, just the better player. Um, I was hoping that Napier wouldn't screw that up, but then shortly after Napier was named the coach, he brought in the quarterback from Ohio State, uh, Miller, I believe. Yeah, Jack Miller. Saying, is that right? Yeah, Jack Miller. So uh, I don't know. I'm always just hesitant whenever a coach just gets named and then he brings in a guy. It's like, okay, this is his handpicked guy. I mean, hell, Josh Heupel chose um, Joe Milton mm -hmm. over Hinnon Hooker last year because that was his guy. He brought in Joe Milton. And I remember reading the, the articles before the season started. I'm like, holy crap, he's really going to start Joe Milton. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that's, that's going to happen. So uh, luckily he, he quickly learned from his mistake and moved on. But as far as Napier is concerned, and, and we've got a pretty good track record with him, both at Louisiana and a short time at Clemson as well. Um, quarterbacks have about, kind of been up and down. Um, it's hard to really put a, put a finger on how successful consistently he is with fantasy football quarterbacks. Now his run game is super impressive. Like they, they do a really good job running the ball. The only problem is he loves, like he loves a committee. Yeah. He, th this dude loves a committee. So, um, and he's bringing in Montreal Johnson from, from Louisiana. So you would think maybe he gets first shot at it, but man, what a step up from the Sun Belt to the sec. Right. But they also got guys already there. You got Lorenzo Lindgaard, right. you got Demarcus Bowman. You got guys already. I, I think Malik Davis is coming back for another year. Yeah. maybe. Like, yeah. And they got a uh, right who can catch the ball out of the back. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's what Napier loves uh, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of dudes that he can run uh, and they they will literally, uh, it's what they did at um, Louisiana would just take turns each series. It'd be a yep. different running back every series. So you know, man, it's it's really hard to put a lot of trust in that. And and I'm somebody that that bought up every share of Montreal Johnson that I could early last year. I felt like I, I, I was one of the early ones on him. Him transferring there did did not do much for me at all. Mm -hmm. So but we might be looking at him on one of my uh, on my stock down list whenever um, that article gets put out. Yeah. I definitely am more intrigued by Montreal Johnson following him to Florida than I am by Amani Bailey going to TCU. That was another weird one. Um, yeah. Yeah, not really much else to say here. Again, I promise I'm not just being a Georgia fan hating on Florida here and everything. Because, again, I do think this is an upgrade in terms of CEO head coach perspective for Florida. Because clearly Dan Mullen didn't want to do a lot of the stuff that re that's required of him being a head coach at Florida. Uh, I've heard thing? Napier's... I was going to say, I heard Napier's staff is really good. Oh, I've it's, heard very, that, that it's very, it's very, very impressive. Yeah, yeah. I, again, he, he's doing very well on that point. If he can just kind of let some of those guys just do their thing, I think he's got a great opportunity ahead of him. <laughs> I, I will throw one one dig at Dan Mullen because, again, you're right. He absolutely screwed up that situation between Aiden or uh, Anthony Richardson and Emory Jones last year. I still can't believe he finally started Anthony Richardson, but it was against Georgia's defense. Like, right? Yeah. What what a way to what a way to kill a kid's confidence. <laughs> absolutely, man. It, he. Gosh, he's, he screwed it up there towards the end, uh, for, for sure, man. Oh, yeah. All right, let's go ahead and move on to our final kind of positive coaching hire. And there's other ones out there, y'all. Like, again, there's so many coaching changes. But, again, these were the ones that we really just felt like highlighting. And, honestly, I might run through a couple here maybe near the end. Uh, just kind of name them. And if they, if you want to touch on any of them, we'll get to it. But, anyway, let's touch on our last one, last positive one here. Uh, we got Kalen DeBoer. Uh, formerly the head coach of Fresno State, now going to be the head coach of the Washington Huskies. Um, last year, 
uh, our good friend, or not good friend, but like our friendly quarterback, uh, Mr. Jake Heiner, uh, passed for 514 attempts for 4,247 yards and 37 touchdowns to 10 interceptions. And on the ground, that offense was able to put together 439 rushing attempts for 1,783 yards and 17 touchdowns. Clearly a very, very productive system compared to what Washington did last year, which was... Uh, what's a nice way to put it? Garbage. It was it was a absolutely putrid offensive game plan they had last year. It's uh, it, it's the it's the juice at the bottom of the garbage. Oh. The, the 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 trash can juice. That's what they're that's what they're like the stuff that leaks out of the bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. The, the the worst of 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 what's the contents are in the garbage. That's that's what their offense was last year. Ah, uh, yeah. So basically, you're going from absolute putridness to a guy that was very, very successful putting together a very, very good offense at Fresno State and at Indiana. I mean, look at what happened to Indiana after he left them. Uh, so, and he got a lot of interesting piece, pieces, pieces there at Washington for him to kind of play around with. You got Sam Heward, former five-star quarterback. Uh, you, he's brought in Michael Penix, who was his quarterback at Indiana. So maybe a little bit of reuniting there. Maybe he can get that thing going again. And then you have two interesting wide receivers in my opinion where you have Jalen McMillan which I know a lot of people are high on they've been high on him in the C2C community for a while but in addition I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Roma Dunze I like him a lot and I think both of those guys can stand to benefit from this what do you think Nate? Totally agree with you uh, again on this one it's I, I'm really curious what happens with the quarterbacks because I do think Heward is by far the best option there um, but just like we mentioned, when you handpick a guy, he's handpicking his former quarterback, uh, Michael Penix, coming over from Indiana. So that would worry me a little bit uh, as a as a, a Heward, Sam Heward owner. But man, Penix cannot stay healthy. So no. I feel like I feel like he, he even even if Heward doesn't get to start early on, he's going to see some action because um, Penix just can't help help himself. He's he's constantly hurt. Um, I'll yeah, the wider, real quick. Um, yeah. Jake Hainer entered the transfer portal at one point, and it was very much assumed that he was going to follow DeBoer over to Washington, but he's back at Fresno State now. But had he followed to Was- followed him to Washington, would you still feel the same way about Sam Heward still being the best option at quarterback there? No, I, I think I, I think two years, um, the last two years, what we've seen from Jake Hainer would show us that he would, if had he made that move, which I think it was more academics that he couldn't, but mm-hmm. had he made that move... Um, that would have, I think that not only would he be the guy there, I think we'd be talking about a, a, a top 20 quarterback for CFF purposes. Probably. Yeah. I definitely would agree. Anyway, yeah. you're saying about the wide receivers? Uh, yeah. What we, what we want to see in fantasy is clear cut options. Um, we don't kind of like we talked about with the, the, the situation in Florida with the running backs where there are not a ton of clear cut. We have exactly that with the wide receivers here at Washington. We know Dunze and McMillan are going to be the two guys. Um, And DeBoer is shown to, to feed his top two guys. So that we really like, I will say um, as far as the tight ends are concerned, um, they got a guy there, Culp. um, Okay. That's kind of a sneaky tight end play. He can go Um, when he had opportunity um, after um, Kate Otten, Went went down a couple times last year. He he could play pretty good. So um, somebody keep an eye on if you if you don't get those early tight ends that are coming off the board and you just kind of want to sit back and wait. Um, you can kind of uh, get Colt, you know, last round type guy. Yeah, I just looked it up. Yeah, he 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 only had eight less receptions than Otten last year. So yeah, definitely somebody to keep an eye out and somebody I will be adding to my tight end rankings after this. <laughs> so appreciate that little nugget there, Nate. And again, like nothing really much else to say. Again, again, DeBoer bringing over his offense to a very putrid system. So hopefully that's a clear stock up from there. If he if if he is not able to successfully put together an offense there, there's just something wrong with Washington. Good lord, my cat just jumped up and scared the crap out of me. <laughs> What's your cat's name? This is Maxine. She guest started Maxine. on the last one. Everybody say hi to Maxine. Maxine, look at the camera. There you go. <laughs> she she doesn't look too stoked to be on. Uh, yeah, she, she she wants to get up in my lap and sit there and cuddle. And I'm like, ma'am, I can't do that right now. 
Anyway, <laughs> let's go ahead and hit up our last coaching change here we want to talk about. We're going on the negative side again here. And we're going to go Tony Elliott, former offensive coordinator at Clemson, now the head coach at Virginia. So, Nate, I'm going to let you take this one. Why are we considering this a negative play for CFF, especially in an off like the Virginia offense has been so good to CFF for the past couple of years. What's going on here? Yeah, sad, sad day for uh, owners of, of of some of the pieces for Virginia. Whenever uh, Bronco Mendenhall decided to uh, um, to call it quits, because man, they have been super successful offensively the last couple of years. Tony Elliott's a fine coach. Don't get me wrong. I mean, he did he did a decent job at Clemson. Um, but I mean, man, that offense was so stale last year for Clemson. And, uh, a lot of people in that area feel like it was really Jeff Scott that was pulling the strings with the Clemson offense. And then he, he left to go to South Florida and, and things just didn't look quite the same at Clemson. You have DJU who looked just abysmal last year and we know he's got all the tools. He's shown that before. Um, but he just, Tony Elliott could not get him right. So it's just kind of a situation where you're kind of, it's this tug and war of, of it's not, it's, it's a slower pace, like I said, more stale type system than what Mendenhall and um, Robert and a were running uh, in the past there. So it's, it's, it's just not having the same pace from a quarterback standpoint because Armstrong is so valuable. Um, it's likely we see his volume go down. I mean, Tony Elliott just does not run the quarterback as much. He doesn't throw nearly the amount of passes that Virginia has in the past. So volume declines. Um, and then looking at the wide receivers, Wicks was incredible last year. Obviously Thompson came out of nowhere, tra- you know, transitioning from QB to wide receiver was successful for him. Kemp's always been good out of the slot. They add in Lavelle Davis who, you know, tore his knee before last year began. And he was a guy that had, double digit touchdowns the year before as a true freshman, six foot six mm-hmm. wide receiver. Um, I just don't know that this offense can support if you're, if you're investing highly, like Wix will cost you a third round pick. If you're investing highly in those guys, I mean, we're talking about four guys that can really play. Can this offense support four wide receivers? I, I, I don't know that it can. He hasn't shown that name me one really fantasy wide receiver relevant wide receiver that Tony Elliott's had at, at Clemson lately mm-hmm. certainly wasn't any last year. So, but I do think one big change is, is that running back could now be a factor at Virginia. It hasn't been a factor for a handful of years now. Um, but uh, Clemson traditionally likes to find their guy and then, uh, and then using quite a bit. So we could see a change there. It's just kind of murky uh, with their running back situation. I would say because uh, Wayne T, I, I cannot pronounce his last name, so I just call him Wayne T. I believe he's entered yeah. the transfer portal, so their clear option there is gone. So it'll be interesting to see maybe they try to bring back one of these younger guys, but also like maybe there is a possibility that Elliot sees that, hey, what they had here already was working, so maybe I shift my offensive like, game plan to fit that a little bit more, but also, again, you can't really bet on that. And to put some numbers to what you were kind of claiming earlier about just losing volume, last year Mendenhall allowed Brennan Armstrong to throw 553 pass attempts. Tony Elliott allowed DJ Uyangalele to pass for 414. So almost 150 less passing attempts. And then you go on the other, other side of the offense with the rushing. Um, Mendenhall had his offense rush for just 339 times last year versus Elliott and the Clemson offense was rushing for 489 attempts. So almost, once again, 150 more times instead of passing. So again, it's a complete shift in what we've known at Virginia if he really does try to shoehorn in what he has been doing. I'm personally hoping, I think a lot of people are hoping, that he recognizes the personnel that he has for at that school is made for what they have been doing now granted i think a good sign for this is the fact we haven't seen players transfer out of virginia really except again i talked about wayne t a second ago but like wicks he's still there brennan armstrong he's still there keontae thompson he's still there lavelle davis he's still there only really offensive player that left again wayne t and then also uh, jelani woods went off to the draft but again, lots of guys go off to the draft every year, even a good system. So it's like maybe that's a sign that 
a lot of those players are hoping that something good's going to happen here? I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, like I said, the from a skill standpoint, skill position, they they've got it. They're there. Uh, all the pieces are in place. Uh, I will say that the the offensive line is a concern. I know they lost a player or two from the line um, due to graduation. They had one transfer to USC and one uh, All American center transfer to Michigan. So they're losing um, they're losing three or four guys off that offensive line, um, which can you know make things a little bit tougher for Armstrong, but. Yeah, the pieces are in place. It's just going to be how much is Tony Elliott willing to uh, to be flexible with his system and try to carry over some of those things that 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 team is used to over the past few years. Yeah, I just jumped up again. All right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, get, I think those are all great points. And unfortunately, we're running a little bit long on here, so we're going to go ahead and move on to the transfer portal players from that we need to talk about. We got 10 of them to get through, so we're going to try to go through them pretty quickly here but we're going to start off with our quarterbacks we got three quarterbacks we want to talk to about today and again we've already touched on this one a little bit but again it's by far the biggest transfer of the offseason so there's no reason not to talk about it we got caleb williams quarterback formerly of oklahoma transferring over to usc nate once again you're a big oklahoma guy so you tell me what's going on here what's what are your thoughts yeah i mean as an oklahoma fan i was crushed to 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 hear that he I, I knew when he entered the portal that, and and literally within, I don't know, three hours, they had Dylan Gabriel already committed to uh, to OU. So I knew that when when that happened, that that was the last we'd pretty much seen a Caleb. Now I will say, man, um, as as Caleb William fans and owners for him for college fantasy, we dodged the bullet. We dodged the Wisconsin bullet. That's oh, yeah. for sure. Um, I will. Uh, I will. Politely disagree with those that feel like um, he was still a really, really high end fantasy quarterback had he ended up in Wisconsin. That poll that uh, CFF insiders put out where like he's asking, like, where would you be like top five, top 10, top 15, top 30? And like, so, like it was like what 70% of them said that they would still put him top five. I was like, absolutely not. No, absolutely no, not. I mean, He's he is an unbelievable talent. I mean, he's a five star. He was the top quarterback coming out before yours reclassified. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the, that's what this pod is about today. That's what the main topic we're covering. System is key. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't want to see him in a 65 percent run first system up in Wisconsin that um prefers to to play their games in a in a phone booth and not spread them out and and let their their players play he, did, he wouldn't have had very good wide receivers mm-hmm. he'd been playing in uh, 20 degree temperatures with 30 mile an hour wind come november i mean that's just not what you want to see so the landing spot I, you know i i think he would have been fantastic for jeff levy i, I think it's an opportunity missed um I, I i tweeted about it earlier if he stayed at oklahoma he would have been the number one uh quarterback on my board um just fitting that you can see a clear transition from him to, I mean, from uh, Matt Corral to him and what their, their skill sets are. Um, but obviously following Lincoln, like I mentioned, he's, yes. he's a QB guru. Um, this is, this is a great landing spot for him. I agree. And again, one, once it was confirmed that he would be going to USC, I basically was planning my rankings this entire time with the assumption that Williams would land at USC. I know, again, we already talked about like there was rumors of Wisconsin, uh, Georgia was involved at some point, and I'm not sure how far people would have knocked him down their boards <laughs> had he gone to had he gone to Georgia. Um, but even still, uh, I basically planned for him to go to USC all along, and he's in my top three quarterbacks, probably going that probably at the lowest he'll ever get is top five um, for yep. me this upcoming year. Because again, like you said, it's just him following his old coach, and that coach has been successful for him so far. There's no reason not to believe it won't be a USC. Let's go ahead and hit up another quarterback here. So with Williams going to USC, who'd he push out? Well, Mr. Jackson Dart, former starting quarterback for USC. Pretty much our first real key indication that Williams, despite all the drama with Wisconsin and everything, was probably going to ultimately end up at USC. A guy like Jackson Dart doesn't transfer away from Lincoln Riley unless he believes legitimately that there is going to be another option there that is going to beat him out. And really not a lot of guys in the transfer portal that could have done that except for Caleb Williams, but even still, 
Jackson Dart does leave USC. So where does he go? Well, he is now with Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss. I have to say, I am excited about this opportunity because again, Ole Miss, it felt like so many different quarterbacks were just not heading over there. Like uh, Cameron Ward was a big one that a lot of people were really hoping might go to Ole Miss. Uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, Caleb Williams, a lot of people were asking like, oh, is Caleb Williams going to go over to Ole Miss if USC falls out and everything? But no, turns out it is Mr. Jackson Dart who does take the opportunity to go over to Ole Miss. And again, I, I kind of like what we got going on here. He is coming in as a package deal with his old tight end. So I kind of like the stack right there. And again, just if you want, uh, if you want proof of is it possible for Lane Kiffin to have a fantasy relevant quarterback? Don't look for any further than Matt Corral last year. He finished as the QB8. Uh, 386 passing attempts for 3,349 yards. 20 touchdowns through the air uh, to 5 interceptions. And then on the ground, he let him run for 152 times for 614 yards and 11 touchdowns. I don't imagine Dart's going to have that same level of rushing volume. But I trust Dart's arm pretty well to kind of make up for the lackluster performance through the air that um, Corral had last year, especially in the mid to late season. What do you think about all this, Nate? I think it's a great fit. I think you covered uh, a lot of it. Um, I would just echo some of those thoughts. Um, you know, he considered Oklahoma. Um, I know Brent Venables and Jeff Levy pushed for him really hard. This is a better landing spot with him. He doesn't have to battle Dylan Gabriel here. He's clearly the starter. Um at, at Ole Miss. So, um, you know, Ole Miss offense will look a little bit different than it did last year because Levy does move on to Oklahoma. Um, Kiffin's bringing in Charlie Weiss Jr., who he uh, who's from uh, South, South Florida that worked with Kiffin at FAU before. Um, and he, it's a fine offense, too. So, yeah, this is a good fit for Dart as well. Yeah. Uh, I can't, I don't have my rankings pulled up right now. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Uh, yes, I can. Let's see. Where do I have Dart? I have Dart as my QB9 right now because of this landing spot and just the opportunity that he has. Where do you think you'll ultimately have him, Nate? He'll be right right in that same area. Um, I hate I hate to be so uh, repetitive with us kind of uh, heading down the exact same direction on some of these things. But yeah, I think, that's a, I think that's a fair assessment. Somewhere I would say between 8 and 12 be where I would have him kind of right. right in that same area. Fair enough. All right, so again... Two of the biggest quarterbacks in the transfer portal finally have their homes. Both good landing spots, I think we can both agree. Let's talk about the third QB here that had a lot of hype going into last year uh, based on what he was able to do in the second half of the season for Georgia. Uh, but then this year comes along, he starts for Georgia, and then nagging injuries keeps him off the field. And eventually Stetson, plays well in, Stetson Bennett plays well enough that JT Daniels cannot take over the starting job again. And he is back in the transfer portal. He will be um, finishing this semester at Georgia and graduating this semester. So he will be transferring as a grad transfer. So he will be immediately available wherever he is going. Um, we've all seen the possibilities with JT Daniels at certain points during the season. Like again, he made Georgia's passing game look modern at times when he was the full-time starter like look no further than the mississippi state game where he in his first start he threw for over 400 yards which honestly like was the first time in probably half a decade i'd seen a georgia quarterback do um but even still like again he's back in the transfer portal and to me the interesting thing here is the rumored landing destinations and that's where i kind of want to get your thoughts on this nate is so the rumor destinations that I've heard for, through my grapevine are some interesting ones. So first one, it, there's one Power 5 and two Group of 5s I've heard. Oregon State is the Power 5 program that I've heard, so moving back out west, getting closer to home. And then the other two are Georgia Southern, where um, Clay Helton is now the head coach, and obviously still close to Georgia, so he wouldn't have to move far from Georgia. And then the third one, this to me is the most intriguing one. We talked about it earlier, Colorado State. So JT Dan is going to join Jay Norvell in an air raid system at Colorado State. What do you think about all three of those uh, destinations? Uh, Colorado State, please. <laughs> I'll take <laughs> option, I'll take option C. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's 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 kind of weird. He's clearly proven that he can play, mm -hmm. right? I mean, he's he's had his ups and downs, but he, he's shown that his ceiling is his good is good. Mm -hmm. um, 
it, I don't know, like the idea that he would, after being a USC in Georgia, two blue bloods, the idea of him going G5, I, I've heard those rumors too. I just, it seems hard for me to believe. It seems like he's a guy that would want to stay in the limelight. It seems like a guy that would want to stay at a program that has nice facilities. You know, once you've kind of lived that life, you don't want to go back to riding crappy buses and stuff like that. So um, he wants to stay in the, in, in the, uh, in the eyes of the scouts as well. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. Colorado state would be fun, man. Um, that, that would be, that would be cool. Um, two, two, the two places that kind of came to mind and, and are along the same lines as Colorado state, but a step up, uh, West Virginia. I don't know what his relationship would be with Graham Harrell. I don't know if they ended on good terms when he left USC, but he, see it. he, he had a good season with Gray. He got off to a good start with Graham Harrell um, before uh, the injury took, you know, before things didn't go right. Uh, the other one would be, we've talked about him before. Kitley hasn't named his guy. What if Kitley handpicked his guy? Um, oh, that would be so and, much fun. And he went to Texas Tech. So those are, those are two that like, I, I have seen nothing that those are options. But um, along the lines of where, from a fantasy football perspective, I'd like Colorado State, I'd like for him to end up there versus Oregon State or Georgia Southern or whatever. So, oh yeah, and again, from from everything I've heard, he's in no hurry. Uh, again, he's focused on making sure that he graduates this semester, making sure he gets all those classes in order. He knows that wherever he goes, he's probably going to get a very good shot to be the starting guy. Because again, he's he's shown that he can be that guy. Um, so again, we'll probably not find out until much later where he's going versus another Georgia player we'll talk about in a second who made their decision very, very quickly. Um, but even still, again, that to me was just the most intriguing aspect of this was just some of the rumored destinations. Obviously, wherever he lands, hopefully he will be somebody that a lot of people will be taking a look at for this upcoming season. So, took care of three quarterbacks. Let's go take a look at some running backs. So first things first, we're going back to USC. Uh, where Travis Dye, former running back out of Oregon, has transferred to. I was a big Travis Dye fan going into last year. I personally thought he was a better running back than C.J. Verdell. I just, every time I saw him touch the ball, I thought he was just more electric. And I was like, man, if we could ever get an opportunity to see what Travis Dye can do when he is the guy, he'll be a massive force for fantasy. And I was proven right after Verdell goes down around midseason and Travis Dye becomes the main back. Dude had 211 attempts for 1,271 yards and 16 touchdowns with 46 receptions for 402 yards and two touchdowns. Now, I mentioned this kind of earlier when we were talking about Lincoln Riley and USC. Him bringing in Travis Dye at running back, I'm a little bit concerned about this kind of dinging the value that Dye would have had at Oregon compared to where he is at now. Nate, what do you think? Yeah, I don't love this for him. Uh, he Man, he was in a great situation in Oregon, but obviously with the coaching change there, it's a mm-hmm. totally new system for him either way. Um, the offensive line, like I, like I mentioned at, at USC, the, 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 the change that he's going to see from the blocking they got at Oregon, one of the better offensive lines over the last mm-hmm. uh, three to four years. Man, Mario Cristobal, say what you want about his – not producing with quarterbacks, but my God, that dude can recruit offensive linemen and he can coach them up. He's a former offensive line coach. So the, the step back that, that, um, die will see an offensive line play is going to be enormous. Um, yeah, I'm with you. I don't love it. It, The fact that they also brought in Austin Jones to Mm -hmm. USC from Stanford. I mean, this is a guy that has a lot of the same skill set as Travis die really really um, good receiver out of the backfield. Jones is Mm -hmm. similar to die, you know? Um, Yeah. I mean, it just, it seems like he he's definitely going from a really, really nice position to all of a sudden there's a lot of question marks around what, what exactly his potential can be this year. Nice player. I, I, I I was, I was totally with you at the beginning of the year last year. I know. And I remember you talking about him and saying that maybe we should take more of a look at him than Verdell. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of a, a weird situation there at USC. Again, like I, I, we, I think it was Mitch I had on where I was discussing like potential landing spots I'd like them to go, and like I still salivate at the idea of him going to Washington. I know it's their rival, but like 
can you imagine Travis Dye as the running back in a DeBoer offense after what Ronnie Rivers was able to do last year? Oh, give me that all day. But nope. Uh, the, the lure of Lincoln Riley was too much. But, you know, can't blame a kid. So go ahead and move on to our second running back here. And that is Mr. Jarek Broussard, running back formerly of Colorado, transferring over to Michigan State. Now, last year, Broussard had quite a bit of hype going into last year. He was drafted as the RB21 in CFF drafts. Unfortunately, though, he finished as the RB158th. So uh, very much one of the bigger busts of last year. And so now, does he possibly have a shot at redemption? Following, I think, I believe it's his old coach. I, I think he was there when Mel Tucker was. Uh, but he's now going over to Michigan State. And the other question I really have with this one is, does this kill any value that Jalen Berger had? Because Jalen Berger looked like he was going to get his shot at redemption, maybe as the lead back for Michigan State. But now you bring in another proven back in Jarek Broussard. Or are we just afraid now that this is going to be a running back by committee and any dream of one of these guys becoming Kenneth Walker 2.0 is dead at this point? What do you think, Nate? This is a this is a really interesting situation in that because I've been super down on Jarek Broussard uh, and I've been super down on Jalen Berger. So this <laughs> is like a weird scenario where two of the two of my biggest fade running backs have somehow ended up on the same roster at two totally different at a different program than where they were whenever I was initially fading them. So um, yeah. I'm a huge Kenneth Walker fan. Uh, Neither one of these guys are Kenneth Walker. I'm not, I I won't own any Broussard or Berger shares. Um, So yeah, they'll they'll be going off in on drafts before I, before I would be interested in taking them. And I'm perfectly fine with that. I'll ask you if you had to take one, like they're the last two players in the player pool, somehow all other couple thousand players have been taken. These are the last two, which one do you take Broussard or Berger? Trying so, you know, I'm re- I'm remembering where um, you know obviously there's the connection with um, Broussard and uh, Mel Tucker was was Broussard's breakout year under is Mel Tucker been has he been at Michigan State one or two years? Uh, this would be his second. This past year was his second year. Yeah, so Broussard wasn't even good under Mel Tucker. Mm-hmm. They, this these. These situations where these running backs follow uh, former coaches when they weren't even good when they were with the former, you know, we see this a lot with um, Gus Malzahn. Yeah, yeah, you see this a lot. Yeah, I see this a lot with Gus Malzahn. It just it baffles me sometimes. Um, I don't know. I would say probably probably give me Berger. I think he's the more talented player. I I still don't know. um, I still don't know how Jarek Broussard had his 2020 season. Uh, It blows my mind that he was that good, um, and the I was. You know, I, I was pretty vocal about him not being able to repeat that this year. And, and that was, um, you know, that, that's what ended up happening. So, yeah, get, sure. Give me a burger. Sounds good. All right. Move on from Jarek Broussard. And we'll go ahead and hit up another running back. Very young one, though. In fact, so young and so, like, hasn't done anything yet that I had a very hard time finding a picture of him in his school's <laughs> uniform. Uh, but it is Mr. Kamar Wheaton running back out of Alabama. Injured his ACL before the year started, so did not play at all this season. Um, So no stats in college ready to go off of, but we do have his recruiting profile here. He was the number 34th uh, player nationally, the number three running back in the class of 2021, according to the 247 composite. And so, yeah, he injured his ACL before the year starts. And now after the year's kind of over, it sounded like there were rumors of him just not attending team meetings and such. All of a sudden, he just wasn't with the team. And then that, all, next thing you knew, he was in the portal. Uh, now, according to Steve Wilfong at 247, he is reporting that SMU is the likely destination for Kamar Wheaton. And for SMU to get a former five-star running back, I think that would be pretty huge. But what do you think, Nate? So, Rat Lashley's shown that he's he can he can produce some really solid, uh, you know, fantasy football running backs. So, that itself is good. Now there's some, a little bit of competition there. Ulysses Bentley's solid. Um, Siggers is fine, uh, but here's the deal with Kamar Wheaton. And, and I know that a lot of the guys um, at campus of Canton mm-hmm. will agree with me on this. Whenever I watched his tape before he came out and before he signed with Alabama, 
I sat there and I watched, I watched it two or three times. And I'm, and I'm just thinking to myself the whole time, how is this guy a five-star running back? I'm not seeing it. Uh, and I, and I was really focused on it because it came down to OU and Alabama in his mm-hmm. recruitment. So as a, as an OU alum, I was really kind of focused on where he was going. And I was just like that. He's not, he's not a top 10 running back in the country. Mm-hmm. So now he's still super talented. Um, hopefully the, the rehab with the, with the knee injury, I guess goes well. Um, and you would think that a talent like that, Rhett Lashley at a level like SMU, I mean, there's, there's gotta be some potential there on down the road. We'll see what happens this year, but from a dynasty perspective, if I own him, I would much rather see him at SMU than I would at Alabama. No, He's not ever going to, he, he, that, that, I mean, it's, it was just too stacked for him to hop enough guys at Alabama. Yeah. And again, I don't like putting out like rumors about a player's character or anything like that, but I did hear some rumors about him, maybe just not enjoying football. And if that's the case, I definitely probably wouldn't want to have him on any of my rosters, but I'm not going to put too much stock into that going forward. So, listen, we've hit up the quarterbacks, we've hit up the running backs. Let's talk about two wide receivers here. The first one, oh, I forgot to update the graphic on this one. Uh, but even still, uh, Nate, you've had to talk about players transferring out of OU. I've got to talk about players that transfer out of my, out of my Georgia Bulldogs. And I'm not going to lie... Jermaine Burton uh, leaving Georgia for Alabama uh, definitely hurt my little bulldog heart. Um, but, I mean, can you blame him? Like, on yeah. just from an objective level, like, can you blame him? Uh, last year, he had 26 receptions for 497 yards and five touchdowns, which is actually very similar to his freshman um, production. Now, granted, in freshman production, he put all that up in, like, like half of that came out of the Mississippi State game where he just blew right up. I don't, it was crazy. Um, but even still, like, you look at that stat line, and that's the only stat line you really need to know versus, like, an Alabama wide receiver where I don't think, I think it's been probably half a decade since they've had any, or since they've had a year where they had, they had zero wide receivers reach under 1,000 yards. And I think they had multiple 1,000 yard receivers last year uh, in Mechie and Williamson. So it's like, to me, like, if I wasn't a Georgia fan, I'd be looking at this and be like, yeah, that's a no-brainer. If you're as talented as Burton is, I believe he was uh, one of the top recruit, top wide receiver recruits in his class uh, at 247. Why not take your chances and go to Alabama and possibly win another ring at this point because Alabama is really, really stacked next year. Um, yeah, and like the, the next question is that people will have is like, well, is he the next Bama receiver? Because everybody wants to know who the Bama receiver is. I'm planting my flag with Jermaine Burton. I have seen this man do things that I have not seen any other wide receiver at Georgia been being able to do in the last uh, like half a decade. And as far as I'm concerned, like again, I've I've gotten reports from guys who have been able to watch practice that quote Burton makes the cornerbacks look silly. And this was in the year where Eric Stokes and Tyson Campbell were still on the team, like. Burton is an incredible talent, and I can, I, again, from an objective standpoint, I can't wait to see what he can do at Bama. I've been rambling a long time because, again, I'm both excited but hurt by this. Nate, what do you think, man? Well, you uh, you certainly have a feel for Burton um, better than I do, given uh, the Georgia, um, you know, seeing him in Georgia for a couple of years. But, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, so this is somebody that that I've, you know, I'll just kind of preview my my – the article that we talked about that I, that I put out, he, he makes it onto my stock up list. Um, you're going from Georgia, no offense, Jared Stetson Bennett and Kirby smart. Um, to now you have. Not taking, we have our daddy. <laughs> day, yeah, absolutely, man. It's such a weird deal going from a, a national that that's the, this is nothing. Um, nothing paints a better picture of where uh, college football is now than this transfer right mm-hmm. here. Uh, a guy leaving a national title winning team and going to the team that they just beat. But yeah, I mean, he's, he's now got Bryce young as his quarterback. This is a guy that's got elite speed. That's what Nick Saban looks for in his wide receiver one. Uh, we saw it with um, Jameson Williams most recently, obviously um, Smith, and Waddle and Judy, the list goes on and on over the last four years. Um, will he be, I mean, obviously he's, he's very similar to Williams and that he is a transfer and, and, and does have that elite speed. 
Um, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to just go ahead and say, yeah, boom, wide receiver one, forget about it. Done deal. But Hey, I, I was hesitant on Jamison Williams last year and, and look where that got me. He, that, that total totally burnt me. So, um, Shame on me with that one. I'll try not to make the same mistake again this year. I mean, I'm with you. I, I was I was off Williamson. I was I was looking at Mechie like everybody else. I was looking at maybe trying to scoop up one of those freshman wide receivers late. Uh, I didn't think he would be become the guy. Um, again, I've I've staked my flag. I think Burton is going to be the top receiver there. I th- I'm pretty sure I moved him into my top ten wide receivers. Let me pull up my rankings again here real quick. Uh yes, I have him at number ten right now. Might even move him up if my suspicions about where he'll be on the team are confirmed throughout spring and such. Um, the only other receiver is that I think could possibly overtake him as the number one is going to be the guy that'll get just as many snaps as him because he's not going to be somebody that's going to rotate in and out with Burton, and that's going to be JoJo Earl. He's the other guy that I've kind of planted my flag on. Even before this, in the first mock draft, I took JoJo Earl in, I think, the sixth round because I'm planting my flag that he is going to be one of those top two wide receivers at Bama going into this next year because, again, the slot at Bama gets a ton, a ton of work, especially on those quick slants that, again, when they have elite speed like JoJo Earl is said to have, he could easily take one of those quick slants and go for a 50, 70 yard touchdown on any given play. So I'll also throw that name out there as well as the other guy. Ja'Cory Brooks, Ajay Hall, I'm fading them for the time being. That's I mean, that's a good call. I mean, Earl's got the he's got the path of least resistance. Mm-hmm. Uh he doesn't have to, he doesn't have nearly as strong competition as what we're seeing on the boundary positions there at Bama. So that's um I think that's a good call. You get some good value with Earl right now. I definitely agree. I'm I'm curious to see like once we get into these deeper like uh, deeper drafts because right now we're only doing like nine rounds and stuff like that. Once we get into the 16, 20 rounds, I'm curious to see maybe if he pops up in some of those kind of mid to late rounds. All right, let's have definitely. another wide receiver here. Um, this one's just interesting to talk about, not necessarily because of his destination, but because of where he went in the middle of this. So we got Joshua Moore, wide receiver formerly of Texas. Then he transferred to Texas Tech with that Zach Kidley offense, and everybody was like, oh, this is juicy stuff. But then he leaves Texas Tech, and now he's going to SMU, where you got Brett Brett Rashley. I think I – no, Rhett Rashley. Two hours, right? <laughs> Rhett, yeah, yeah, Rhett Lashley. Rhett Rashley. Anyway, but now he's with them. So it's like he went from the Sarkeesian offense to the Kidley offense to the Rashley offense – and like he has three good options here. I'm wondering why he might have settled at SMU. Do you have any thoughts on this, Nate? I don't. I don't know why. Um, you know, he had verbally committed to Texas Tech, and then, and and then all of a sudden ends up in in Dallas at SMU. The the weird thing is too is that you could make the argument that it's actually a more crowded wide receiver room at SMU than it was at Texas Tech. I can he, agree. I I think he would have for sure locked up an outside receiver position at Texas tech uh, with Eric as moving on. I mean, that that was a good fit for him just to kind of take that role. Um, now, I mean, they've got Rishi rice, Tyler Goffney proved that he was solid at times last year as a true freshman, Roderick Daniels is a true freshman. Um, Bo Corrales comes over as a transfer who plays an outside position from North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he's, he's shown he's been okay at times. It just, I don't know. It just seems like there's probably more competition, even at SMU, the smaller program than at Texas tech. So yeah, kind of a weird deal. Yeah. I, I, I would definitely, definitely agree. And like, again, I'm, I'm just a little baffled. It's like you, you had a perfect opportunity. Like I was ready to draft Joshua Moore pretty highly. If he went to Texas tech, now I'm a little, like you said, that, that SMU wide receiver room was already pretty, pretty established. And like, I've talked to some guys like bitch, I know for a fact when I questioned this at first, Mitch was like, I actually would take them over, take him over Rashley or Rushy Rice. I would take him over uh, Dylan Goffney. I'm like, I don't think I'm ready for that, especially with his injury history. Like Moore is one of these Texas wide receivers that have just not been able to stay healthy for the past couple of years. Absolutely mind boggling. Yeah, he's and he's got, uh, you know, once again, we're not here to beat up on on college players, but uh, a little bit of a known off the field uh, track record of of. Being 
uh, a little bit of a headache in the locker room. So um, just kind of hard to see, you know, we'll just have to see how that plays out. But I mean, Rishi Rice, Gaffney, Daniels, these are guys that have built a rapport already with, um, with Tanner Mordecai and the quarterbacks on staff there. So, yeah, I mean, um, I, I can see betting on the talent, but at the same time, well, that's, um, there's some decent players over there at, at uh, and, and SMU brings in some nice freshmen too, uh, as wide receivers. So yeah, there's some, some nice could, players there. Could be at the end of the day, he just likes living in Dallas more than Lubbock. <laughs> could very well be just that. All right, yeah. we'll go ahead and move on from somebody who's transferring away from Texas. And we're going to talk about a tight end that is transferring to Texas. And that is Mr. Jaleel Billingsley, tight end out of Alabama. Once again, moving on to Texas. Uh, man, Billingsley had a year this past year, and not in a good way. Um, a lot of people were drafting him as like that next Bama tight end that maybe would take a step forward this year, especially with guys like Smith and Waddle leaving for the NFL. Maybe it wouldn't be another receiver outside of Mechie or Williamson that would step up, but it would be a tight end like Billingsley, who has a lot of good recep or has a lot of good receiving work. Maybe he was a guy that could step up and kind of fill in that volume hold going on there. And he pretty much did the exact same thing he's done all three years, about 17, 18 receptions, 256 yards, three touchdowns. And not to mention, he started off the year in the doghouse with Saban because uh, he just was he just didn't get on the field and Cameron Lottu was put out there instead of him. And then he had a terrible, terrible last game in the championship against Georgia. Several key drops, especially early on in that game, that forced Bama to kick field goals rather than touchdowns in that game. And if those field goals are turned into touchdowns, that's an entirely different game from that standpoint. Wasn't long after that game that Billingsley entered the portal, and it looks like we'll follow Steve Sarkeesian over to Texas. What do you think, Nate? What do you, what do you think's going on here? Do you, is Billingsley somebody we should be excited about in or with a quarterback like Quinn Ewers in an offense like Steve Sarkeesian's? I, I think we could see a slight uptick in, in what he's done at his time at Bama. Um, obviously, familiarity with Sarkeesian. There's a couple other Alabama coaches, former Alabama coaches on the Texas staff. So it, it seems like the right fit. Um, I mean, he's he's not a traditional tight end. He's He spends all of his time um, – you know, uh, not off the line of scrimmage. I mean, uh, he, he doesn't do a ton of blocking. I think he only weighs like two, 220, 225. I mean, hell, uh, Traylon Burks is probably bigger than Jaleel Billingsley, but uh, he's talented. I mean, he's talented. He's got a nice, um, you know, he's also got an unproven but talented quarterback throwing the ball. So um, there's potential there. Uh, he's, you know, he's not somebody I'm going to get super excited about, but uh, the talent has always been there. So if he can – somehow Sarkeesian and that crew can pull it out of him. Um, I mean, we could be looking at, you know, a 40 catch, 600 yards, seven TDs type type production. Mm-hmm. I could I could see that. But yeah, I, I, I thought this, this was interesting. And I, I just looked at my rankings. I'm, currently, it's my tight end 21. I feel like that's maybe a little too low. Um, but even so, like, I don't know. Just the fact that he hasn't improved year after year. And then again, like, it's, again, this isn't rumors. Like, he's been a knucklehead for Saban, especially early on in this year and everything. Uh, so if that kind of stuff continues, I could see that impacting his future even at Texas. Um, but we'll we'll see kind of going forward. We'll touch on our last one here. Not very often we have one tight end in the transfer portal news, but we actually got two this week. Um, but we're going to talk about Mr. Michael Trigg, tight end out of USC, following Jackson Dart from USC to Ole Miss. Now... To me, this is very intriguing because, again, you have Trigg following Dart. Dart is who we're all expecting to now be the starting quarterback for Ole Miss going forward. And the amount of target vacancies at Ole Miss is astonishing because you got guys like Dontario Drummond and Bray- Braylon Sanders gone. Jacor Pearson, gone. So who does that leave over? Well, you got Jonathan Mingo who's coming back for another year. So you have to imagine he'll he'll get plenty of work. But... None of the other receivers, at least as far as I've known right now, are really striking me as those clear next guys up. So why not take a dart throw? A dart throw. Oh, uh, ooh, nice, yeah. nice. Why not take a dart throw on possibly Dart's favorite target, a guy he's built repertoire at at USC, came into the same class as him. Maybe that there's a connection kind of building there. Maybe we do see 
Michael Trigg be that number two target? Maybe, maybe num- again, I'm talking crazy here, but maybe that number one target at Ole Miss next year. What do you think, Nate? Well, you mentioned Billingsley being right around your tight end 21. I would, I would definitely have Trigg ahead of that. Trigg is somebody that this is, this is a good fit for him. Mm-hmm. All the reports out of USC, uh, even though he was a little bit buried on the depth chart as a true freshman last year, all the reports were, was, man, one guy that really stood out in practice today, Michael Trigg, all that yeah. guy does is make, make plays. Um, and here he is as a package deal with Jackson Dart. So there's obviously a relationship there. Um, he trusts him. He's bringing him with him. But here's here's the important thing. We're talking about systems. A couple of years ago, under um, Lane Kiffin, Kenny Yaboa put up oh, a yeah. really put up a really nice tight end season there at Ole Miss. Uh, the new OC is Charlie Weiss Jr., who came from who spent time at FAU with uh, Lane Kiffin, and there they had Harrison Bryant and yes, John Rain, who put up some really really Harrison Bryant had. Um, you know, I want to say like 65 catches and, and I don't know, 900 yards and seven TDs one season. So really, really high end tight end work happening there. So yeah, I like this. I like this move for trick. This is this, everything seems to be pointing towards, okay, we've seen that he's, we've heard that he's got the potential. Now he's got the opportunity. Absolutely. And I, I just looked at my rankings and everything. You're right. I have him way ahead of Julio Billingsley. I have him as my tight end seven right now. Hmm. I, I, I have him in the top. That's 10. pretty spicy for a guy that I don't, I don't know has uh, caught more than a handful of passes, but I, I he like had, it. He man. caught seven passes last year. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. honestly, again, this tight end class is just so garbage for this year yeah. that I'm willing to, like, if I'm that late in a draft and I'm just throwing darts, I'm going to take a guy like this who has insane upside potential. And if he doesn't work out, I'm stuck streaming tight ends, but there are far worse things in this world than streaming a tight end CFF. Let me let me ask you this. Um, I'll, I'll give you a scenario. So okay. you have the option. You have the you, you waited on tight end. You didn't take the the, the big uh, two to three. Yes. You know, top end tight ends. You waited a few tiers. Would you rather take Michael Trigg mm-hmm. or uh, who who has that? that high risk high reward, or that, you know, he's got that ceiling, but hasn't shown anything, or would you rather have, um, let's say a Ben Urasik or a Sam Laporta who has shown that they're solid, but let's be honest, they're, they're limited in those offenses. So I actually have Urasik ahead of Laporta because with, or, or I have Urasik ahead of Trigg and Laporta behind them both. And the argument I'll have here is this. Yurisek's a young guy. I don't think he's reached a ceiling yet in that offense. We kind of saw him get more and more work as the season went on last year. I don't think we've seen the cap there. Laporta, I think we've seen the cap. I believe he's going into, what, his junior, senior year? I, he's been the guy there pretty much ever since... Um, why am I blanking on their names? Uh, Hawkinson and Fant went off to the NFL. He's pretty much been the guy ever since then. I think we've seen the ceiling for him i don't think we've seen the ceiling for eurosec yet and i don't think we've definitely seen the ceiling for michael trigg yet i would probably take eurosec ahead of trigg because there is a bit more proven commodity there that he can be that heavy targeted guy in certain games um but again laporta i've seen i've seen my fair share of him i'm not super impressed and if i'm gonna again if i'm in this tier that late in a draft i'm gonna take a guy with insane upside like trigg okay nice the kind of the same mindset I would um, take like a guy like Joshua Simon at Western Kentucky. Okay. Where it's like, we've seen sparks, but let's we'll see if they can go the full distance. Gotcha. Yeah. I like it. All righty. So those are the main 10 that we're going to talk about here. I'm going to run through a quick list of some kind of smaller transfers. And Nate, you stop me if any of them like really tickle your fancy. I feel like it's worth talking about. Uh, I'm going to run through them real quick. Uh, I'm not going to start any conversation on them. Miles Marshall, wide receiver out of Indiana, is transferring over to Miami of Ohio. Shane Illingsworth, quarterback out of Oklahoma State, is transferring to Nevada. Lavisia Carroll, running back out of Georgia, is transferring over to South Carolina. Braxton Burmeister, quarterback, former starting quarterback out of Virginia Tech, is transferring to San Diego State. Trey Shropshire. Wide receiver out of UAB has withdrawn from the transfer portal and is staying at UAB. 
Dylan McDuffie, running back out of Buffalo, has also withdrawn from the transfer portal. He will be staying at Buffalo. Taj Harris, wide receiver out of Syracuse, formerly committed to Kentucky, has now switched his commitment over to Rutgers. Jeremy Singleton, wide receiver out of Houston, is transferring to Georgia Southern. And then Malik Heath, wide receiver out of Mississippi State, is transferring in the same state to Ole Miss. Nate, any of those guys kind of tickle your fancy? Uh, I'll just run through a couple real quick here. Illingsworth, uh, I think that's a terrible landing spot for him. Nevada, everybody leaving <laughs> to go to Colorado State. I joked about it on Twitter. Maybe he just didn't realize that uh, the whole staff had left. Where did um, everybody go? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lavoisier Carroll, uh, I don't know. That's kind of interesting. I mean, he was a top 10 running back coming out. I mean, four-star type guy, Georgia. Moved him over to DB. I mean, y- I'm sure you're well aware of all this, but oh, I yeah. mean – USC uh, East there, um, South Carolina, they got, they, got a, a, they, they got a handful of players already in the backfield with Lloyd, McDowell, Christian Bill Smith comes over. But if he can take control of that job, I mean, that's, that's somewhat interesting. And then uh, Dylan McDuffie returning to Buffalo, great call. I, oh, yeah. I'm, glad that, I'm glad that he did that. It's, it's still a, a, a solid fantasy-producing uh, spot there for running back, so it's good to see him go back there. Yeah, again – I'm 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 heartbroken that Trey Shropshire uh, went back to UAB with Drew from the portal because I was again if you've listened to me say it on this show before I've said it on Twitter as well I was hoping so badly he would go to Ole Miss I wanted yeah. I, I I wanted him to land at Ole Miss because again there was just a ton of opportunities there he's a great deep threat I would have loved to have seen just over the top shot after shot at, for him there I'm not maybe it's academics the reason why he has to stay at UAB but like. I don't know. I just felt like there was opportunities for him to move up to the Power Five, and unfortunately, that just didn't happen. Um, Jeremy Singleton, wide receiver out of Houston, going to Georgia Southern. I find that interesting if JT Daniels joins them at Georgia Southern. If not, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, other than that, that yeah, I would have on, yeah, on this know. list. I, I on this list. I would. I agree with you. I would rather have seen Shropshire or Taj Harris end up at Ole Miss than I would Malik Heath. Yeah, pretty much. Like, again, like, like I think it was uh, Sal. God bless Sal on Twitter, but he, um, he was just like, "Oh, is this not like exciting?" I'm just like, "Yeah, I I want Ole Miss to pick up a transfer wide receiver, but like this doesn't feel like it. <laughs> this no. doesn't feel like the guy that is going to be like that obvious one or two guy going forward." So with that. That pretty much wraps up our show. Went a little long today, but that is A-OK because, Nate, you are awesome to have on this show, and I'm sure everybody is loving to hear your analysis. Before we go, Nate, I once again just want you to plug anything that you're working on going forward, whether that is your articles or maybe just give us a teaser on some ideas you might have for the future. Again, we got a lot of stuff coming out. So what do you got? Yeah, just check, like like you mentioned earlier, check us out on uh, Campus to Canton. Those articles will be coming up here before too long. I know both of us are, are working on some stuff there. So Stock Up will be out soon. Stock Down players will be out shortly after that. And then, uh, you know, spring practices will, will get kick-started and, and I'll, I'll put together some articles once, once we start getting some information funneling out of uh, spring camp. So, um, yeah, check us out there. Um, and as always, you can get me uh, at CFF Nate on Twitter as well. Absolutely. Again, guys, I'm so excited, like what we can do with Campus of Canton. Now that we have like a full team there, uh, we'll be able to like put our minds together and bring you guys some products that I think you guys are going to love going forward, whether that be articles, whether that be additional packages you can purchase, whether that can be just more podcasts we're going to bring to you guys. It is very, very fun to finally have a platform to really and some resources behind us in order to get those kinds of things going. Very, very excited. But even so, if you're listening to this show on podcast, make sure you're subscribe or you're following us on those platforms and make sure you leave those five star reviews. Always, always love reading those. So appreciate it. And maybe in the future we do some stuff with that that maybe you could do some you could you could win something. I don't know. I got some ideas floating around my head. We'll see. Um but in addition to that, if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you for looking at our pretty faces for about an hour and a half here and appreciate y'all listening and watching. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you hit that notification bell. Make sure you leave all your thoughts down below. Which coaching uh, changes are the most inspiring to you? Which ones do you hate the most for your CFF players? In addition, what do you think about all these transfer guys? Again, we have to have half of our show be transfer guys from now on because so many of them are transferring every single week. Even still, Nate... Thank you so much for coming on, and thank you all for listening. 
I hope you guys have a wonderful and blessed day. Thank you.